So hello and welcome to Daily Space for today, October 1st, 2019. I am your host, Annie Wilson. Dr. Pamela is traveling today, so we're going to pretend it's a Wednesday and do our rocket update a day early. Tomorrow is going to be a little different because I'm also hosting, but we'll get into uh, kind of a focused view of one thing, probably related to the stuff that I usually cover. I'm thinking tomorrow we'll talk about uh, the UAE astronaut and things of that nature. I haven't quite decided yet. If you have any ideas, go ahead and post them in chat. So for the news, I'm sure you're all going to have questions. If you have a question, please use the purple star emote to grab my attention and the attention of mods and that will allow me to see your question easier and I should be able to answer it when everything is all said and done. So yeah, yeah, um, let's get at it. So the things, as always, we're going to start with the things that launched. There was only one launch this week, only one launch this week, and it was Roscosmos on September 26th. At 7.46 a.m. Hey, humans are talking. At 7.46 a.m. UTC, an Echo Kilo Sierra-3, a.k.a. Tundra, military early warning satellite was launched aboard a Soyuz 2.1 Bravo rocket. And yes, yes, there is totally launch footage. This is your reminder that rocket launches are loud. Reminder, rocket launches are loud. And I'm gonna hit play now. Imagine they're doing some final checks up there. All right, here's the launch. Ready? You ready? The support arms are coming back. And there she goes. That's it. Um, <laughs> yeah, that wasn't as loud as some of the other videos, but still an impressive launch. It looked like it was a little rainy, but uh, as far as I know, everything took off really well. So, um, of course, everything's like, no, now we're going to be in a weird thing. Um, this satellite did not go into a typical orbit. Dr. Pamela, let me, let me rewind a little bit. Dr. Pamela talked about the Tundra mission last week. So we're going to spend a minute on Tundra's actual orbit. As I just mentioned, Tundra did not go into a typical orbit. But first, a reminder of two common orbits, geosynchronous and polar. So a satellite in geosynchronous orbit goes around the equator like this while a satellite in polar orbit goes over both the North and South Poles, like this. So if the Earth wasn't at a tilt, and you imagine the Earth upright, one goes this way around and the other one goes this way around, all right? 
geosynchronous, polar. Geosynchronous, polar. All right. Both of these orbits are fairly round, like a circle with the Earth in the center. And the satellites in these orbits tend to move at a steady rate. No speeding up or slowing down. Remember that. Tundra will not be parked in either of these orbits. Instead, Tundra is destined for Monia orbit. Monia orbits are shaped more like an oval with the Earth at one side and are at more of an angle. A satellite in a Monia orbit does not travel at a constant speed. I repeat, a satellite in a Monia orbit does not travel at a constant speed. As that satellite approaches the Earth, it speeds up and literally whips around the other side. Uh, when it's far away from the Earth, that same satellite moves slowly, much slower. This gives the satellite extra time to look at certain locations. For examples, latitudes that are close to the poles. You know, where Russia is. So this orbit allows visual and communications coverage of high Earth latitudes because one, it's high altitude at Apogee, which is 39,700 kilometers away from Earth. That allows a large coverage area. Two, the high inclination, 63.4 degrees, that allows coverage to be placed over areas that don't usually get much, if any, coverage. Three, sorry, three, the combination of this high inclination and this high altitude at apogee allow for the slow transit times, literally when it's just kind of hovering there, uh, prolonging the desired coverage while the low altitude at perigree, you know, when it's close to the earth, when it's actually only 600 kilometers um, away from the earth, allows it to speed up, minimizing the less useful close in part of the orbit where they're over bits they don't care to image or communicate with. Um, I believe the entire orbit is like 12 hours and it spends probably less than two or three whipping around the earth. So it spends all that other time just kind of hanging out, hanging out far away from the earth. Um, Dave adds, think of it as a long period comet orbiting the earth instead of the sun Super zippy and close, but super slow further out. I hope that made sense to all of you. I tried my best to make it make sense. Um, we have bonus facts for that. Um, the actual, is the actual orbital period really only 718 minutes? Alexa, what's 718 divided by 60? 11.9667. Alexa says that it's 11.9667 hours. So yeah, that's close enough to 12 hours. So the actual orbit period, 718 minutes is time to match Earth's side real day, which is, which is the rotation with respect from the stars. You have exactly two orbits for every one side real rotation of the Earth, which is about four minutes short of the full 24 hours found in a solar day. Whew, that's a mouthful. All right. Second bonus fact, it takes, it only takes three satellites in three of these orbits to provide not only uninterrupted coverage, but also easy switching between satellites, since the oncoming satellite and the outgoing one are only a few degrees of arc difference from the ground station's antenna's POV point of view, and still quite slow moving in both cases. Uh, he adds that there's a four hour dwell on each satellite. The third bonus fact, is the term for the orbit in Russian translates as lightning, which may refer to the high speed portion of the orbital track. Um, but connotation, military connotations of the name are on a kind of unavoidable. And a fourth bonus fact that relates more to orbits than specifically the Monia orbit is a sun synchronous orbit is essentially a polar orbit that happens to be inclined in such a way to pass over the earth at about the same time each day, resulting in similar sunlight angles. Whew, 98 degrees relative to the equator. It's as close as polar, um, 
it's as close to polar as you get. It makes little difference. Uh, just that slight inclination makes sure that the orbit adjusts due to gravity at the same time. At the same rate, the sunlight angle changes. All right, I hope you all understood that last paragraph because I kind of understood that last paragraph. Anyways, with that, moving on. Have some Cheerios, Tinker. I made it through a bunch of rush, rough Russian words. Oh, oh yeah, and there's a video. That's why you're staring at this. All right, so we're gonna play, now that I talked all about these Molnia orbits, we're gonna play this video. Um, let's see if I can get it full screen for you. Not really. All right, mute the music. So this is of the point of view of the satellite. You see some Iridium satellites uh, on those polar and geosynchronous orbits. And they're moving at a constant rate. Here we are for the close-up. Whee! And there we go further away. Um, now we're at the, uh, near the apogee or approaching the apogee of the orbit. And it's almost like the satellite is hovering because of how slow it's going compared to when it was close to Earth. And you do get that really long coverage time just kind of hanging out there. And again, you can see the Iridium satellites still moving at their fairly constant speed. And now we're approaching Earth again. And you might be able to see the satellite speeding up. And here we are again. Super close, moving super fast, and it cuts off there. So that is a pretty cool animation. Thanks, Dave, for finding that. You are awesome. All right. So now that we talked about the things that launched, let's talk about, come on, Google, you can do this. Let's talk about the things that are launching. So next, the things that are launching this week, there are three launches scheduled for this week. The first one is, the first launch of the week belongs to China. On October 3rd at 1800 hours, 44 minutes UTC, they will be launching a long March for Charlie rocket, but, wait for it. There's no official word of what the payload is. Color me not surprised. Anyway, this image that you are looking at now was shared by Launch Stuff on Twitter. It is an overlapping image of no-fly zones. Uh, Launch Stuff on Twitter shares haven't found any identical matches. However, two similar-ish ones in the same track our long march for Charlie's from last year, <laughs> with one carrying Gaofin 5 and the other three Gaofin 1s. So the blue box is for the upcoming launch, while the purple boxes are for previous launches. And we have a visitor. Hi! That is not a baby. Come here. I know. Do you have, do you have strong feelings on the Chinese launches? You do? Okay. Let's see if I can find you a treat. All right, so while I find Tuffy a treat, because that's what he's here for, um, I have a sneaking suspicion of what satellite is, what the payload is, what satellite in particular. So we mentioned the Galfin, the Galfin uh, satellites that had previously been launched on 4Charlie, uh, yeah, four of Charlie rockets. They are civilian, civilian um, Earth observation satellites. And there's only one left in this whole series of satellites that has not been launched yet. And that is the Galfin 7. And it is indeed scheduled in the distant future at an unnamed date to be launched on a Long March 4 rocket. What I've seen is Long March Bravo, but I would not be surprised if it's a Long March Charlie because the Long March Charlie, or the Long March 4 Charlie can carry a bit more to some synchronous orbit. So the mass of the GF-7 is 2,400 kilograms. That's 1,200 two liter bottles for Americans and it is destined for a sun synchronous orbit. That same Long March 4 Charlie rocket can take up to 
2,800 kilograms to a sun-synchronous orbit. I believe the four Bravo rocket can only take 220, or no, I'm sorry, not 220, 2,200 kilograms. So there's about a difference of 200 kilograms between what the GF-7 weighs and what the four Bravo can actually, you know, launch up into orbit. So this is not for sure. This is, I have not seen anything on the interwebs that has said that it's going to be uh, this Gaofin or GF-7, but this is my educated guess. So, no money bets, but this is what I think it's going to be. We'll see if I'm right next week. I don't know, bud. Do you think I'm going to be right? He's like, I don't care. Where's my trade? All right. All right. So that was the first launch. On to the second launch this week. The next up on the launch schedule is International Launch Services. On October 9th at 1000 hours, 17 minutes UTC, they will be launching UTELSAT 5 West Bravo and Mike Echo Victor 1 on a Proton, Proton M rocket. Oof. So this mission was supposed to launch on September 30th. The reason for the launch change was a quote, was quote, a problem related to the interface between the Russian control system and the spacecraft electronics, end quote. So um, let's talk about the payloads for a little bit. UTEL, UTELSAT 5 West Bravo or Echo 5 Whiskey Bravo is a high capacity KU band communication satellite which will serve customers primarily in Europe and North Africa. The B or Bravo in the name is usually indicative of how many satellites are operating in that particular orbital slot. In the short term, uh, this Echo 5 Whiskey Bravo will share an orbital slot with Echo 5 Whiskey, you know, UTEL Sat 5 West. And both of these satellites will work together to provide service to customers. In the long term, the new satellite will already be in position to take over operations when the older UTELSAT 5 West is no longer operational. So that is the satellite. UTELSAT in this image is, I think, on the left. So on the right, we have the other payload, which is MEV-1 or Mission Extension Vehicle 1. It is intended to test the concept of onboard mission extension of existing satellites by attempting to rendezvous with Intelsat's IS-901 communication satellite. Once in position, the craft will then attempt to physically join with that satellite, something IS-901 and its counterparts were never designed to do. And from that point on, they the uh, MEV will provide station keeping and attitude control services for the out of fuel bird, which will then continue its mission. If this is successful, the IS 901's useful life might be extended for up to five years or more, depending on how efficiently the MEV can maintain the position of the joined craft. IS 901 was launched in June 2001. The satellite is literally older than my nephew by several years and has long since passed its expected 13 year operational life. Yeah, the satellite was supposed to be done operating in 2014. That was, if I recall correctly, five years ago. Uh, Dave adds, Think of MEV as a wheelchair or walker for an elderly satellite who can otherwise still take care of itself. It just doesn't get around like it used to. So, yeah, I, I thought that was a pretty cute analogy. Are you done? Apparently the cat is leaving us. Apparently the cat is leaving us. I know, I fed you before I started. I fed him before I started, I promise. Anyways. I have a video for you about this mission and I promise the, um, 
this this video is actually from 2018, not 1988. You'll understand why I'm saying that in a second. No, don't play again. So yeah, that's pretty wild. That is pretty wild. And speaking of Northrop Grumman, I know, buddy. I know. All right. Apparently we need to take another cat break. Do you need another treat? Do you know there's only one more launch left in the slide? Mm -hmm. Okay, so... The last launch of this week, third launch of this week, is by Northrop Grumman, you know, who also just happened to uh, work on MEV. So this one is a little bit of an unusual one. So, listen carefully. On October 10th, at 1.30 UTC, or if that doesn't make sense to you, think of October 9th at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, Northrop Grumman is launching Icon on a Pegasus rocket from a, from Stargazer from Cape Canaveral Air Force Base in Florida. All right, let's take a second and break that down. We're used to seeing missions being launched on rockets. That part's not a problem. So Icon's going to be launched on a Pegasus rocket. Cool. What we're not used to seeing is rockets being launched from airplanes. Yeah, this rocket is not being launched from the ground. It is being launched from an airplane. So what does that even look like? Are you ready? Are you ready? It looks like a huge commercial airliner with a rocket strapped to the bottom. Not joking. This is an image of Stargazer, which is a... Humans are talking which is a Lockheed L-1011 Trijet. The third jet is... Oh, you probably can't see it very well. The third jet is here, up here on the tail. And then there's one jet on one wing, and you can't see... It's, it's hidden behind the rocket, and the other jet's behind the rocket. Um, yeah, it is only one of three that's still considered flight-worthy. In a commercial configuration, these planes could carry up to 400 passengers. It's, this is a pretty big jet. Um, during its time in service as a mothership, Stargazer has launched at least 43 rockets and I believe over 80 satellites. 
can't remember the exact number, but I, I believe it is over 80 satellites. So now let's talk about the payload. Icon. So Ionospheric Connection Explorer or ICON will study the ionized part of Earth's upper atmosphere. This is the region where Earth weather meets space weather. So you know how Dr. Pamela says that space telescopes are dead to her until they get first light? ICON is an example of why. The first launch date was in June 2017. Yeah, June 2017. Repeated delays have kept pushing back launch. It's been wild. Like this thing was the last launch window for this was in October, November, December of 2018. So hopefully, hopefully it will launch within a week. Well over two years from the original launch date. Uh, that's that's a minute. So once ICON is in orbit, it will collect data of plasma and airglow to further our understanding of the density, composition, and structure of the ionosphere. Oof, oof. So yeah, that's two years. That's wild. So that wraps up all of the rocket news I have for you today. So I am going to take this opportunity to remind you to ask questions in chat. Please use the purple emote. And while you're doing that, I will also remind you that this is a production of PSI. That's Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University here in Youngstown, Ohio. We are brought to you by you. So thank you for all of your subs, your bits, your donations, your pledges on Patreon, uh, your merch purchases, your being here and hanging out and chat, your moral support. And yeah, yeah, you all are awesome. And if you can't afford to contribute financially, we understand, we really do. It's okay if you can't just Come hang out with us. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Uh, listen to our podcast. Uh, what are other some? What are some other free ways that that they can, you know, help us out? Tuffy, Tuffy's still eating his treat. Um. Oh, inflict us on your friends and family and strangers. Inflict us on your friends, family, and strangers. Um. And I think, I think that's given you all enough time to ask some questions, and I know I saw some earlier, so I'm hoping I can scroll up all the way to see some! Antissa, wait two years, patient. Yes, Veronica, that that totally describes Icon. All right, let's see if I can scroll all the way back up. All right, um, what, what are you doing, cat? So yes, I don't know how many times the cat has interrupted, but the cat has interrupted. Ernster says, man, fall has been lean with launches. There's a whole bunch scheduled, but they don't have firm dates. And I'm okay with, you know, a slow uh, launch thing. Kevlar asks, how was, how was my trip? Um, I didn't take a trip. I essentially just took a staycation and took care of a few things that needed taken care of. So it was nice. It was nice. I got to hang out with the cat and the dog. Tinker was very appreciative of that. Oh, more bits! More bits, Tinker! Oh, I don't even have the dogs up. Give me a second, I'll get the dogs up. Because she's like, I hear it, I hear it. Hold on. Alright, so we have all the bits. Is you ready for the bits, Tinker? And start! <laughs> Make it rain! Cat, you still have some treat. I think the cat is done with his treat. He's going and sitting down. Alright, so, oof. I got stuff all over me. Um, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. <sighs> oh yeah, I, I had forgot to talk about the accelerant for the uh, Soyuz rocket. It does use UDMH, which my models are kind of screwed up because I was trying to show off methane versus methane. I don't want to talk about that. For a second, I forgot all the semesters of chemistry I took. So that cloud of UDMH and N2O 
O4, which I'm sure somebody is going to be like, it's dinitrogen tetraoxide, which I can't ever remember in the point. So here is the, the hydrazine, the two nitrogens, and here are the two methyl groups. That's how you get dimethyl. And this is the nasty looking, let me flatten it out for you. Um, N2O4, the dinitrogen tetraoxide. So this is the oxidizer and this is the fuel. It's really nasty stuff. You don't want to breathe it. You don't want it on you. Um, the reason why it's used is because it can be stored in the rockets long term without um, a whole lot of extra stuff. And it can be throttled. It's essentially like the perfect hybrid between liquid fuel and solid fuel. It just happens to be super toxic. So. Yeah. Um, Zion makes a comment about Monia orbits with the right orbit. You can combine both. I don't know if that's Monia and Tundra orbits. They are separate. Um, orbit slow over your territory for communication, very low at uh, Peregrine for sky images. Oh, well, you gonna come back for the rest of your trade, or are you just gonna sit there? Okay then. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Guido says, "Good thing I have my echo set to German voice recognition." I apologize for nothing. Side e real rhymes with cereal. Side real. Spy images at Peregrine says Zine. Yeah, that would be crazy. Bad Panda Bear says, I was wondering if anyone had theirs go off. So Veronica asks, both me and Dave, how much ballpark would it cost to send a CubeSat to Neptune? I actually don't keep track of how much uh, launches cost because to me, they're all just millions of dollars, millions of, and billions of dollars. Um, I don't even know how long it would take a CubeSat to reach Neptune. Would it still even be, would it still, would the lifetime even be usable? Like, those are the questions I have. Um, Kerbal asks, why are we talking about Monia orbits? Because that is the orbit that the Tundra satellite was in for the one launch that happened last week. So... Yeah. I'm still scrolling through chat. I'm trying to find stuff. Some discussion about how much it would cost and they're saying like 500 million, say a billion dollars. Um Something about a GoPro canned air and a ham radio. <laughs> oh my goodness. Alright. Um... Noel says, Orbital rendezvous and docking is my favorite thing to do in Kerbal Space Program. That's amazing. Um... So... Dave says, note that iOS 901 solar panels um, continue to provide power for the payload. It is the batteries. The batteries on the MEV are only big enough to make use of the partial sunlight they'll get. And I saw a follow, so and make it rain. Tinker's like, your fist is above your head, mom. All right. And bits from Wayne. Thank you, Wayne. And make it rain. Kerbal says that Stargazer is the last flying L-1011. I got my info from Wikipedia. Y'all, I try. 
Um, looks like it. Kevlar says that the stargazer looks like an orca about to give birth. Oh my. Okay, now I'm caught up in Kevlar with the bits. More, more bits. <laughs> ah, Tinker says thank you. I say thank you. And I think I'm all caught up. Trucker Kev says 25 bits treats for the cats. Well, he, he wandered off and I, I don't know where he is. And make it rain. I can't, he is the, I can't have a cat cam because he's just simply, uh, he doesn't like to stay in one spot. He doesn't like to stay in one spot. Well, come here and I'll, I'll, uh, oh, flight worthy does not mean actually flying. Okay. Both statements are correct. GoPro Wi-Fi cam on the cat. I'd be afraid of what y'all would see. Toffee, come here, buddy. So the cat is fickle. He is fickle. He still has a little bit of his treat left. He, uh, so for, for those of you that don't know, my cat is hype, has hyperthyroidism. And um, I'm thinking this is still side effects of him missing a single dose Saturday night, or it's time to increase his dose. Um, hyperthyroidism means that his essentially metabolism is running really, really hot. So he needs a lot of food and we have good days and bad days. And apparently today is going to be not a good day, but hopefully not a bad day. Um, yeah, yeah. So any other questions? Uh, Dr. Pamela is traveling today. Um, we are going to do, I am going to host tomorrow. I think we will talk about um, the UAE astronaut because there was some stuff that I had read, you know, preparing a little bit for last week's slides that I thought was kind of fascinating and we don't really talk about a whole lot. And, um, of course, we'll talk about how many people are on the space station. I don't think they, I don't remember when they come down. I'll probably actually look at that for tomorrow as well. And, um, yeah, talk about toilets and stuff. There were links in the slide deck. Awesome. Well, I, I will check those out. Are you, are you going to sit, Tinker? Why do you have fluff on your mouth? These are things I don't, I don't know the answers to. Um, so yeah. Unless y'all have more questions, which I don't think y'all have a whole lot of questions. You guys are kind of quiet. Um, as far as I know, the rest of the week, aside from tomorrow, Dr. Pamela will be hosting. She is in Tucson. I think she's in Tucson. I'm fairly certain she's in Tucson. Um, so y'all can just envy like the desert social stuff behind you. The podcast for today is already recorded. I've already sent it to Dr. Pamela. Um, so that should be out shortly. This will be archived on YouTube. And the podcast for tomorrow will probably just be us chatting. I kind of see tomorrow being a um, kind of a conversational interactive in-depth thing. Also tomorrow I am on the weekly space hangout. So will the links be on the Patreon transcript? Um, any links that I used as sources will be on the Patreon transcript. So there are a lot of links. That's actually the next thing I need to work on is formatting uh, everything for, uh, yeah, formatting everything for, uh, I guess the blog post, which also goes out for the Patreon stuff. Um, yeah, when I do my slides, I put, well, that's not good. That's not a good sign sound. Um, when I do my slides, I do put all of my sources at the bottom. So yeah, they'll do that. Anyways, anyways, that was a bad sound that I need to go take care of. 
Um, I think I've said all the things I need to say. Again, thank you. Y'all are awesome. And I'm going to roll the credits. And I will see you. I think I can roll the credits. I think I can roll the credits. Um, where is it? Okay. Now I'm ready to roll the credits. So I will see you tomorrow. So have a wonderful insert time of day here. And yeah. Continue being awesome, and I will see you tomorrow. Bye!